Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames broke their streak and finally won a season opener and then won the next one as well. They're now 2-0 and to start the season, the first time since 2009. I'm Dan, alongside Matt as always. And uh, Matt, why don't we jump in and talk about how we got to where we're at? Well, to be fair, the last time the Flames won a home opener period to start the season was 2009. So it's one of those that hey great we're matching at least hopefully that stops at this point because they didn't make the playoffs this that year so you know similarities are there (laughs) uh so the flames had their home opener and also their season opener which uh took place on october 13th at the cell dome taking on the defending stanley cup champions and you and i had talked before this game about how this would probably be a, a really good test to see what the Calgary Flames were this year. Well, well, it, it, it's interesting that this week um, both the games were against the Western Conference finalists. Um, so uh, definitely a good way to set up a measuring stick against each of them early on. And we beat the champs. 5-3, uh, yeah. to three, big win at the Saldo. Matt, I was trying to find out on Twitter afterwards, is this like an MMA or boxing where if you beat the champs, you become the champs? Well, hey, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, boys, take your rings off, send them down the hall. Well, they already did. They gave it to Kadri in our dressing room, so there you go. <laughs> Could we have asked for a better first period from the Flames? I know it was only 1-1, but when I look at the tempo, the way the team played, like to me, that was what you want out of this team, three periods a night. Well, the, the line that I was actually most curious about was the Kadri, uh, Kadri Dubé, and Manjapane line, uh, just because I th- on our last show i mentioned like that i thought that might be a good fit and i am really liking both the chemistry the speed and the defensive acumen of the trio of players because in that game like literally anytime they had the puck in the offensive zone if they turned it over by the time the avalanche player got the puck there was somebody on them and if they chipped it up to somebody else there would be somebody on them. And like they were able to hem the avalanche in their zone because they were able to quickly get in on guys and play defensively responsible, which led to all sorts of opportunities for the trio and a couple of goals, if I recall correctly. So, you know, like it, it was a very impressive effort by those three, and I thought that was the Flames' best line on the night. Yeah, I was really impressed by Kadri and the way that he uh, came out against his old team. Would you have expected, Matt, if we were to have made predictions on who the first flame to score this year was, they would be Brett Ritchie? Well, I can imagine him specifically because last year it took until like the very last weeks of the season for him to finally get off the donut. It's like, nope, I'm getting my homework done right now. Thank you. Good night. Bye. <laughs> All right. I scored. I got my quota. Someone else can go score now. Yep. <laughs> Dubes, you're up. Job done. <laughs> That's right. Um, but yeah, the, the first goal of the season for the Flames, Brett Ritchie from Lucic and Uyghur. So Uyghur got on the board right away. Um, we also we had Uyghur uh, also assist on the Anderson goal. Kadri assisted on the Toffoli goal and Huberto on the Lindholm goal. So a lot of the new guys getting points in this first game. Yeah, and uh, to comment on uh, Mackenzie Weger, I thought he was very impressive at both ends of the ice. Very much picking up where he was last year in Florida and why he was so highly thought of by a lot of people, like especially in the analytics community. And was showing that throughout the game where he was physically engaged shut the avalanche down was physical add points did everything you want was there a flame in this one that a flames player who you looked at and said ah maybe not the best game uh trevor lewis and that's stretching it just because he played a very trevor lewis game and he was, well, I was fine. Say, he, to me, he didn't look bad. He just looked like what you expect from Trevor yeah, Lewis, which is a fourth-line player. But uh, like you could see the rest of the guys having a, a lot more tempo. Like Even uh, like Michael Backlund's line had a couple of minor mistakes. And uh, the penalty kill that led to the third avalanche goal, like they kind of got a little lost in their defensive positioning. But... Other than like those instances, like Calgary did a very good job of any time uh, McKinnon or McCarr had the puck, like they really tightened up, 
the gap control. They collapsed in on the goalie to make sure that like there was no shooting lanes for Makar specifically and made it as difficult as possible for him to do his wizardry. And I thought they were very good at... Like, you can never stop guys like McKinnon or McCarr or McDavid or Dreisaitl to carry on it into the next game. You have to just try to keep the, their contributions to a minimum. And they did allow McKinnon to score on a breakaway, but that was pretty much the only really dynamite chance that he got away with in the game. And McCarr didn't really have any opportunities where he could just do his thing. Yeah, I think that's fair. Well, let's move on to the next game then. Uh, Calgary Flames went on a short road trip up the QE2 to Edmonton for first Hockey Night in Canada game of the season. And uh, John, and in this one, I think the big surprise, Markstrom not in net. Uh, Dan Vladar took the net here. Markstrom wasn't feeling well. And the Calgary Flames had a 4-1 to lead after the first, ended up with a 4-3 victory over the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah, this game reminded me... Of- a fair amount of some of the playoff games from last year um, where like Calgary did overwhelm the Oilers and uh, then it, well, they basically chased Jack Campbell and they required the backup to come in and the backup uh, Stuart Skinner did a fantastic job for them. Uh, The flames hit the post several times as well. And like, if uh, Skinner was not on the top of his game, like, the Flames probably score seven or eight in this game. And the difference... Jack Campbell lasted 10-18. When was the last time you remember a goalie getting yanked after 10 minutes? Uh, the, uh, Daryl's been, uh, you know, someone who's done that. I know for a fact he's done that before. But, uh, yeah, it, it's one of those where the Flames just were completely overwhelming everything that Edmonton was doing defensively and they pretty much continued throughout most of the game. Uh, they had a little bit of a lull in the second period when they scored those two goals, but like once the Oilers drew within one Calgary, just shut them down entirely and just started generating offense again. And if not for Skinner standing on his head, it could have easily been seven or eight. Calgary had played, I think, best in the first and the third periods here. And I think, you know, the fact that they got all their goals in the first, Edmonton came out in the second, looked considerably better, in my opinion, than the Flames. But then the Flames were able to come back in the third, regroup, and sort of continue that first period, I think says a lot about the maturity of this team that maybe we haven't seen as well. Because often, how often have you and I talked about in the past, you know what, the Flames uh, didn't do well, they kind of got down in a period, and they stayed down. Well, and I think this is where personnel matters. And the Kadri line being added to the mix, uh, like if we look at our centers from last year, Lindholm, Backlund, and Monaghan, um, Monaghan has never been very good defensively. Adequate, but not good. And, you know, Kadri is one of the elite defensive centers in the league. And having basically three excellent two-way centers allows the Flames to deal with McDavid no matter what of those three lines is out there at any given time. And you're not really going to see too many shifts where McDavid's out against the Lucic line. So it's one of those where uh, Calgary was, uh, just by personnel, uh, was able to more effectively shut down the McDavid line because of the just general defensive awareness of those players. Yeah, I think that we checked the Oilers' top guys really well. I think that's something the Flames haven't done as much in the past. They haven't really been checking those guys. They'll try to do a lot of other things, not successfully. But I think last night was the first time I can remember in a while that we had a really good check on the Oilers' top forwards. Yeah, well, you could see like Evander Kane really didn't have any time or space during the game to get going. Um Every time Dreisaitl had the puck, there was somebody on him like almost instantaneously. And McDavid only got through with one good shot on a power play. And like when it was five on five, like I didn't really think that the Flames allowed him anything more than perimeter shots. So uh, it was as good of a job as you can really do realistically against players of that caliber. 
But and when you're talking about good centers, I think that the Michael Stone goal in the first was really that really shows you what happens when you have good centers and you can win draws. And that's one thing the Flames haven't been as smart at in the in well, I guess just haven't had the centers to do, but they really haven't been winning a lot of faceoffs the last couple of years. And when you can win a good faceoff, that Michael Stone goal is exactly why you need good centers. Yeah, and praise to Michael Stone for being a very good offensive player um since really the start of training camp like he had three goals in the preseason a goal and two assists in this one uh, just overall a very effective player on his the first three-point night of, of his career what did you think of dan vladar here i think from i mean obviously it's one game but we also saw him in the preseason i think he looks like he's grown a lot since last year well that back when uh, like we did our uh, show before we acquired Vladar and we were talking about uh, like acquiring a young goalie to be a backup. It was kind of with this idea in mind of, well, that guy might not be getting an opportunity, but you know, having Markstrom in the way allows that guy to focus on taking those next steps without having to be the guy where like, if the whole pressure of the season is on you, like you might struggle a bit, but he's been allowed to, develop while on the job and the difference now that he's uh, i think he's now 25 like that he's starting to come into his own and you know like he always posted really good numbers in the ahl and um before he got to the the, the a and he's starting to look like potentially a starting caliber goaltender in his own right and if that's the case you know, eventually you're going to have to see whether, like, he can take over for Markstrom or, you know, like, exactly what you have, frankly. And it might be a situation where in a season or two, Vladar's the starter and uh, Dustin Wolf is the backup. And, you know, we trade Markstrom to free up some cap to sign, you know, insert player here. Nothing else. We'll need that cap to sign Vladar at that point. True. But um, I mean, he's he's on a league minimum now. You're not getting him for that again next year. No, and it's one of those where he's really in charge of his own destiny, and he has the ability, and he's looking like he's putting the parts together. Like he's a very big goaltender at six foot five. I mean, he's very mobile in the crease, and you know there are very few flaws to his game. So if he can put the whole package together like he could be a very good goaltender in the nhl and that is just awesome for us yeah i mean we'll talk more about him in in a few minutes here but i was really impressed to see especially against a team like the oilers uh just how you know just how good he looked i mean this wasn't preseason this wasn't you know rookies playing this was nhl caliber hockey during the season and it's amazing to see, um, you know, him. I guess playing the way that he is now. Yeah, well, you got to figure that the Oilers are likely going to finish first or second in our division, probably second behind us. Um, so, like, they're a quality team uh, enough, like in terms of offensive talent, to you know give the goalies a test. It's not like he's going out and playing like the Arizona Coyotes of the league. Like, it was a good playoff team and he was up to the task and that's awesome. Like a check mark beside his name. Good to know. And let's see on the next one. And uh, it, you know, if he can continually play at this kind of a level, then it really doesn't matter when you're going to throw him in because it's kind of makes him and marks from interchangeable at that point where, you know, like if you need to put Vladar in for 35 games instead of 25, it's like, yeah, sure, cool, because well, you're so, getting so that caliber of goalie. So since you're mentioning that, let's go there. Um, Daryl Sutter said that he wants to play Vladar about once a week. So in a 26-game season, you would have 26 Dan Vladar starts. I think you could even get more than that, but I think that's kind of the minimum they want is once per week. So, yeah, I think, you know, like you were saying, 30 – I think 30 games is not unrealistic for this guy then. No, and especially if he continues to play at a high level, especially down the stretch, like we're playing a lot of games uh, in March and April. If you look ahead in the schedule against 
teams that should be more bottom feeder ish teams just based on like how they finished last year and the fact that they didn't improve. So, you know, it's one of those where, you know, as we're getting ready for the playoffs, having both guys going, um, in case of, you know, necessity. And like we saw last year after the whole, uh, you know, finally breaking through the brick wall that was Jake Ottinger, uh, like Markstrom was burnt from having to be perfect through all of those games. And he, you know, like the Flames didn't realistically have a viable alternate. So even when he started struggling against Edmonton, there was nobody else and you just had to run with it. Where if both guys are going, you can kind of mix it up where, you know, like if, say, Markstrom isn't playing well, you can throw Vladar in and be reasonably assured that, you know, it, it's a doable alternate instead of, well, we're just kind of throwing the series here. Yay. <laughs> well, and I think, too, I mean, Daryl Sutter's never been one to really, and, and you sort of mentioned last week, jokingly, not even know who his backup is sometimes. Like, he's not one who praises his backup. So to come out and say, I have this plan to play Vladar once a week, I think that really says something about Daryl and noticing Dan Vladar and what he brings to this team. Yeah, and like with the, the two goalies, like if you're not really seeing a huge difference between the end results between the two guys, you know, like if Markstrom surrendered three against Edmonton yesterday, it'd be like, yeah, that makes sense because Edmonton's a good team offensively. You know, Vladar, yeah, his goals against right now is 3.0, but, you know, it, he is going to get some starts against some softer opponents where he'll only give up one or zero. So, you know, it, it's one of those where if things are more or less comparable, then there's no real need to worry. You know, it's literally situational. And, like, if anybody like has a minor problem, like they tweak something a little bit, but it's not that big a deal where you could still start. You could just throw the other guy in and give the guy proper time to actually recuperate without having to worry too much one way or the other. Another story this week, and I guess congratulations should go to our head coach. Daryl Sutter got wins number 700 and 701 this week, which puts him now in the top 10 NHL coaches ever for most winning coaches, Daryl has has coached 1,399 games. He has 701 wins, 503 losses, 101 ties, and 94 overtime losses. Um, the only coaches above him are Peter Laviolette, Alan Vigneau, Paul Maurice, Al Arbor, Lin Lindy Ruff, Ken Hitchcock, Barry Trotz, Joel Quenville, and Scotty Bowman. And if we look at those numbers, Daryl's at 701, uh, Laviolette's at 718. Alan Vino's at 722, so he will probably jump into probably eighth. He's not going to get 777 this year, which is Maurice, but probably jumping into even the top eight by the end of the year. Yeah, and he's been a very good coach for a very long time, and he's, you know, like that's one of the reasons why I wanted him back. I thought he was one of the top two or three coaches in the NHL. I still think so. And, you know, he... Yeah, he's arguably one of the like three or four best coaches since Scotty Bowman last coached. Yeah, I think I think that's fair to say. And I mean, if we look at where Bowman is on this list, um, Scotty Bowman's number one. You know, I mean, he had yeah, he had a lot more cups as well. He's probably the best coach there. And even if we look at this list, I'm surprised how many of these guys are active or what I'll call active-ish, like. You know, Laviolette's still coaching, who's right above Daryl. So actually, Daryl might not pass Laviolette if Laviolette keeps going up. But uh, Alan Vino, Paul Maurice is still active. Um, obviously, Al Arbor's not. Lindy Ruff is. Ken Hitchcock, last coached in 19. That's not too far away. Uh, Barry Trotz last year. Joel Quenville last year. So, yeah, I mean, of those guys, a lot of them still active. And it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out, if those guys can, you know, move into... I don't think anyone will ever be Bowman's numbers. No. Um but, you know, if they can even move into those second, third, fourth, fifth spots. Yeah. So good for good for our coach. I think it says a lot about, you know, what a good coach. And you and I have had this discussion a lot. We don't even have it again today. But what a good coach can do for a team. Yeah. And 
we're seeing that like the difference between like the this and last year's iteration versus the Jeff Ward era or the Bill Peters era or the Bob Hartley era or the Gullitson era like it's like night and day like everybody's bought in like especially through the first two games of this year it's like everybody's on the same page let's go and that's a big deal so Matt after two games um what are your impressions of Flames lineup right now uh the first line looks a little shaky to be honest uh with Toffoli Lindholm and Huberdeau that said, Huberdeau and Toffoli looked like they were really fighting in that Edmonton game well, and the thing is, is that Toffoli's getting a lot of chances. And he's, like, he hit the post a couple of times. He I, he scored a goal. He's looking reasonably good out there. It's just that you can tell the timing is, like, a, a millisecond off. And, like, the pucks are just getting a little ahead or a little behind. And, like, it's just not clean yet. But that that's just a matter of the fact that they've been together for a couple of weeks and have played like five games <laughs> or something together. Um, I would expect that the struggles to continue for another week or so, and then it to start tighten up uh, as you move along. And with there not really being a realistic option to replace to fully uh, in the organization at the moment, um, cause Dubé's fit in on that second line, like a glove, that, uh, you know, Toffoli is basically there for the longer term. And, you know, if there aren't adjustments and, like, they're still out of sync, you know, like, say, a month or two from now, then, you know, the pressure on for living to go out and get somebody to push Toffoli down the lineup a bit might be there. But, you know... It, Everybody's to contributing. Explore, even so. to explore other... I mean, maybe at that point you try Manjapani on the first line. Yeah, it's one of those where it would depend on where the team is at at that point. But I think you got to just kind of let it grow. And if it doesn't, you know, they're contributing offensively, though. And, it, you know, they're generating lots of scoring chances. They're just as dangerous as the second line has been. It's just little hesitations here and there, which allows the goalie to get set, which, you know, when those passes are getting through clean, like the, the goals are going to come like mad. And like, I could easily see those guys go on a tear where they're scoring three and four goals as a line each game. It's just, you know, it's not quite there yet, but it looks promising at, I'll give it and that. we know they're good players, right? I think it's just a chemistry yeah. issue. Like, I think it's, you know, it's not these guys aren't going to do well. They just need more reps playing together. Yeah, and it's like, uh, he, you know, like with Toffoli, for example, he's used to receiving passes in a certain manner. And it's hard to go from somebody who is an adequate passer to, like, the best playmaker in the NHL. <laughs> You know, because that guy can feed pucks through the air right on your stick when you're not expecting a pass to even be coming. And, you know, there have been a couple of plays where, like, he was, he looked to be surprised that, oh, the puck is here. And, it you know, he bobbled the pass just because of the fact that he was kind of caught off guard. That's not a problem. It's just an adjustment where okay, I, I'm on the ice, therefore I have to be ready to receive a pass no matter what, where, how I am. You know, I could be sitting on the ice, be ready to <laughs> to receive a pass to tap it towards the net. You know, it, it's one of those where when you have a guy like Huberdo, you have to be ready and he'll get there. I I'm, would not be shocked if uh, Toffoli and him figured it out sooner than later and, yeah, and both have a really I good think- year. And I think, like you said, Toffoli's getting a lot of chances, and that goes all the way back to the playoffs. And I think, you know, Toffoli just needs to get one in to sort of break that bad luck streak, and then I think he's going to come alive. Yeah, like, I put it this way, I, if that, that line finds the chemistry, Toffoli's going to score 30-plus. You know, it, Lindholm will score 30-plus. So it, it'll be it just a matter of them figuring it out. And, you know... When you score nine goals in two games against, like, the two, like, conference finalists, 
you know, you're you're doing all right offensively as it is. So, you know, there's no rush. <laughs> Yeah, I thought uh, that first line, like I said, I thought, especially in the Edmonton game, Huberto and DeFoley seem to be fighting it. I think that second line, the Kadri Dubé, Manjapani line is going really well. We saw Kadri get his first point against, or his first goal, sorry, against Edmonton. The third line of Coleman, Backlund, Lewis. I like what we've seen from Backlund and Coleman so far. I mean, Lewis is there, but as you and I talked about, it's not the right spot in the lineup for him. Yeah, it, it looks like uh, back a couple seasons ago when you had like Goudreau, Monahan, and Levo, where like the one guy's just not. Well, remember when they had Richie on the first line? Yeah, and it's like something doesn't belong here, <laughs> you know. And, yeah, like that's not a slight on Lewis. He's just he's a really good fourth line player. It's just with the third line guys, you need to be able to get about 30 points and like have that level of offensive talent not be a 10 point guy and like that's the problem with both Rooney and Lewis is that they're more like 10 12 point guys which that's fine they do an excellent job defensively and are good at what they do it's just that you're asking too much of a player that's just not capable of generating on the offensive side which is taking away from Backlund and Coleman's abilities like the old game mastermind, right color, wrong position. I mean, he's a good piece of this team, Trevor Lewis, not on your third line. Yeah. Like him, Richie, uh, Rooney, and Lucic, th- those pieces in whichever formation, awesome fourth line. Uh, you know, as good of a fourth line as we've had in a long time, It, it there's just not enough there there in order to... And like and that's it, where like uh, you know like the coaching staff and everybody was kind of hoping like Peltier take it you know or, well but even then I think you know at what point do we try Rujicka there on the third line he has yet to to draw in yeah and I think when he does that's where he'll be is on the third line left wing like especially like if the third line struggles again against Vegas um, then I would assume if not playing Rujitska against Vegas after that, putting him in to see, you know, and honestly having Rujitska who's got all the tools, but needs guidance. Uh, I having him on a line with Backlund and Coleman, I think would be pretty much perfect for his situation just because he's a good offensive player and, and a good size player. It's just the effort level isn't always there, but having those other two guys capable of backing him up when he's not having a good time uh, will help. Flames fans have had a lot of negative things to say about Kevin Rooney and Brett Ritchie so far this season. You know what? They're both good for what they are. They're fourth-line players. They're just fine for that role. Do I want to see Brett Ritchie on the first line again? No, but as a fourth-line right wing, he's fine. Oh no! And uh, like I, what do you need normally out of a fourth line guy? Somebody to go in when the puck's been dumped in, go smash the defenseman, and you know create havoc in the def- offensive zone. Him, Lucic, uh, they've both done that. Rooney's done that. That's exactly what you need. And you know, like the, they haven't really been a defensive liability that line. Uh, Lucic has actually looked really fast, and I did laugh when he beat out Makar on the puck battle, which and then the subsequent foot race because it's like, what? <laughs> but um, you know, he he's looked a lot more quick this season than he did last year, even. Um, so whatever off ice or uh, off uh, game training that he's doing to improve his foot speed is working a bit. Because he's looking like a lot more like his old self. On the back end, I think Mackenzie Wiegers looked fantastic. Um, I would say the other defensemen who we know from last year, Tanev, Hannafin, Anderson, and Zadorov, have all come at as advertised, and I would say are playing the way I expect them to. The big surprise here is Michael Stone. Like, what's up with this guy? Well, I'm actually going to give some praise to uh, Nikita Zadorov. I think he's actually taken a bit more of a step forward in his career as well. Uh, he's looking a lot more composed and settled defensively. And because he, he was very much prone to making mistakes throughout his career before last season. And like he's playing a lot more quiet of a game and just simple. 
you come down my side, you're going to get smashed. And, you know, he, but not getting out of position while doing so. And I've just noticed that his game has looked a lot more composed through the first two games, which that bodes well. Yeah, and I think, you know, I agree with you so far. I want to see how he does after a handful of games more. Oh, I agree. The team has looked good so far. I think even his mistakes, if he's made any, have been minimized. So I don't want to say he's looking a lot better until I see more than two games out of him. Oh, true. It, it's one of those, you, you got to give props when they're doing it and then, you know, criticize when they're not. And for right now, he's doing great. So, and now on to Michael Stone. The- Michael Stone does not look like the guy who was 7-8 last year. I mean, this guy looks like he deserves to be in the top six, doesn't he? Well, not only that, like he, when he first started his career with Arizona, like he was a premier young defenseman, which I I don't think some fans might realize. Like there, there was even talk of uh, a stone for Hamilton trade at one point, like a one for one, uh, Dougie Hamilton, uh, just for reference. And it's one of those where, you know, he ran into injuries and like that's basically plagued him since his coyote days. Uh, but all the time off uh, due to being a healthy scratch has allowed him time to heal up and work on elements of his game. And from like this is not the same Michael Stone that we saw at the beginning of last year. Um, there's more of a confidence and a swagger in his game. And he doesn't even he looks exactly like the Michael Stone that came up with the Coyotes in the first place when he was looking like a higher profile guy and with his offensive abilities like that slap shot frankly like it hit it, even when Shillington comes back like it almost would be beneficial to have him dress like only dress 11 forwards and have him in there just so that way he can be utilized on the power play with that slap shot and and how many guys do we see that have a slap shot like that um that you know aren't good defensively like he's that rare breed that can do both yeah like he's been okay like he not to say like he's been great defensively but you know certainly a good number six defensively um and yet with the that offensive talent like he's like a top pairing defenseman offensively uh and that even stems back to last year where he was like with the end of the regular season in the playoffs he was basically at a half point per game which you know it's like 40 points for a defenseman like that's elite offensive numbers and like right now he's got three points in the three games like that's really amazingly good for uh, a player of stone's ice time and you know like he it hasn't been on pp1 and so it's good to see and if that can translate like that all of a sudden throws another weapon in the mix because like while hannafin anderson and Weger all have good slap shots they don't have the level and caliber of slap shot that stone has um and you know even though it's like a difference of like five or six miles per hour it makes a difference and you know if the flames can utilize that weapon properly like that's a huge boon to the organization and it's hard to find guys like that especially in the modern nhl so yeah (laughs) like uh, it's found money basically because like stone uh like we've often mocked the fact that you know like he goes away in the the summer and then training camp rolls around oh i guess i have to show up on a pto and then signs and yeah i mean i've always thought he's a just fine number seven but now he's really showing us that he's worth more than that yeah potentially again only two games in oh for sure but even like going back to like the last 20 games last year uh, with the regular season and playoffs, like he looked like a full measure quality defenseman, and it, it, you know he did not seem like a real wreck defensively. So it, it'll be interesting to see if this continues. Like if this is the Michael Stone that we're getting, like you pretty much have to play him, and it 
becomes a problem of, well, now we have seven good defensemen, and then what well, do you Well, let's do? wait and see what happens with Shillington, because we still don't know what's going to go on there. True. Interesting to look back at the Michael Stone trade when we made it. It was on February 20th, 2017. The Calgary Flames acquired Michael Stone, who was making $2 million at the time. Um, 50% of his deal was retained. In exchange, we traded our 2017 third-round pick, which turned out being to be the guy we just saw on Edmonton Stewart Skinner, and our 2018 fifth-round pick, which turned out to be Akira Schmid, who's another goaltender currently in the New Jersey system. So neither of those picks stayed with uh, the Coyotes, but um, you know we'll see how they both turn out. Yeah, well, it, there's a reason why Arizona is not very good. <laughs> Uh, you know, they, they make weird trades and then, you know, squander assets and then perpetually are bad and then end up in college arenas. So, you know, <laughs> success. <laughs> so Matt, we, um, should, do we need to talk about the goalies? I think again, the goalies, we talked about Ford's defense. I think the goalies, um, Vlad- Vladar, we talked about earlier. Markstrom, I think, as advertised so far. Uh, uh, Markstrom struggled a bit in the Colorado game. He looked a little sloppy. Not a big deal. First game but of the season, also if and he's, he's, if sick. he's If he's sick, I'm yeah. going to chalk it up to that. Yeah, exactly. Like It makes entire sense with his illness that, yeah, you're not going to be... And it makes sense why Vladar started the second game. Like I'm sure Markstrom would have if he was feeling better but you know it, it, it's a luxury we don't need to have markstrom play every game and no and, and i mean if we're gonna have let's just say that daryl does start uh vladar 26 times so even if that's the minimum right i mean that that gives markstrom 56 starts of an 82 game season that's still way less than last year oh yeah and that's where like uh, markstrom ideally needs to be around the 50 ish game just to be fresh for the playoffs. Cause yeah. he looked exhausted in the Oilers series. I think you'll probably see uh, Vladdy get up to 30, which would give Markstrom 52 starts. I think that's uh, for a guy of Markstrom's age. I think that's about where you want him to be. Yeah. And like, that's why like it, the, this whole situation on all sides is beneficial for everybody because Vladar is legitimately looking like a goalie of the future in his own right. And so Markstrom doesn't need to worry about having to shoulder all the load on his own. And yet Mar- Vladar can, he, you know, Markstrom's there as like the security blanket of, well, I can just do my thing while he does his thing and, you know, allows everybody the time and space they need to do what they need to do. Yeah, and it gives them, like you say, it gives them options. It gives them a security blanket. It's it's that okay if our starter isn't ready, um, you know, let's not send him out there. And I think with Daryl saying that he wants to play, you know, the backup once a week, I think that's going to help fans, especially to sort of hold him to that and media and even the team to hold him accountable to that and say, hey, you know, why isn't Vladdy starting this week? So I wonder if that's one of the reasons he said it. Just yeah. to sort of hold hold the organization accountable to it. Yeah, and you know, and the, you look at the goalies that are in the flame system between Vladar and Wolf, um, and even to a lesser sense, Chechelev and Arseniev, um, that um, they're. Uh, it's not like the eras where like the Flames had McElhenney and Keatley and Danny Taylor and Leland Irving and Henrik Carlson and Red O'Bara and Yanni Ortio and Kari Ramo and Jonas Hiller, where, like, all of those guys are just mediocre, even at the best of times. Hiller was a little bit better than mediocre at the best of times, but that was before he was a flame anyway. But, you know, it, it's one of those where, like, now, like, the flames legitimately have options. Like, where if Markstrom gets hurt or Vladar gets hurt, you're not like, okay, well, now the other guy has to start every game because we don't have anybody else. Wolf can come in and actually be a viable backup as well. Yeah, and, and, I, th- and I think if you're just looking for a backup, I mean, Oscar Dansk is here as well. I think mean, that's another possible option for a backup. Yeah, I, I agree. And he he filled in with Vegas a couple years ago, and he played all right. Uh, like, there's 
definitely options where, you know, it's not like, oh, who the heck <laughs> is going in net? You know, like, you might as well get the Zamboni driver from the Leafs at that point. <laughs> you know, because, uh, like, there's not, you know, a lot of those guys before were not very good. And now, like, the Flames actually have legitimate depth, which is, like, the first time in forever. We encourage every week for our fans to submit their comments, their thoughts, whatever they want to hear us talk about, uh, either on our website at firesidechat.ca, and you can find a way to email us from there, or even leave us a voicemail through there. Um, you can also uh, get a hold of us on Twitter, where we're at Fireside Podcast, on Facebook, facebook.com slash firesidechat, on Instagram, we're firesidechat underscore podcast, and Matt, we're one episode into the season and we already have some feedback from a listener al who sent it via email excellent he asked he asked is sutter signing for two years meant that there's a two-year plan before cup materializes or is it a one-year plan with a one-year contingency in case it doesn't happen this year why don't you take that first well frankly i think uh, it's more of we're competing now for a sailing cup and for the foreseeable future like you look at free agents for the flames this year it's basically Tyler to fully um, next year. There's a few more, but more or less like this team can be kept intact uh, for the next few seasons. And even if you're going to retool, y there are players that you could conceivably walk away from and bring a young guy in uh, like a Connor Zari or a uh, Jacob Peltier to come in and be a viable replacement and uh with uh, the current situation like the flames are basically built to go for the stanley cup like realistically this team needs one more top nine forward in some manner and other than that it's like okay let's go you know like we have the defense we have the goaltending we have eight of the nine guys cool I don't think, though, that you build your or you sign the coach saying, well, we're going to do one year with a one year contingency. I don't think they look at that year that, OK, this year we plan to win the Stanley Cup. But if we don't, we'll do it next year. I think you look at it as a, as a contendership window. You say, OK, we've got three years where we think we're going to be a viable contender and we're expecting we might win it in one of those years. So, you know, I, I, I just I can't see them coming out saying, OK, we're signing Daryl for two. We think we'll win it this year, but if not, well, we've still got next year. Like I think you're looking at is, as you and I talked about last week, I think probably a three-year window to win the cup. Yeah, and even like after that, um, it at that point it becomes more of a conversation of uh, do players like Coronado, Peltier, F Phillips, um, Zari, do they actually materialize into NHL players? Uh, that are good as top nine forwards. Uh, does Wolf emerge into the goalie that he's looking like he will be, which is like another Mika Kiprasov level guy? You know, like all of these questions will answer themselves as time goes on. And like that will either expand or curtail the contention window for this team. Because like if you look at the Flames defense core, basically everybody's a young guy except for Tanev and even he's young ish. So, you know, like this whole organization basically is set up for like now and potentially for more. It's just sure. But if we, if we just focus on Al's question, I mean, you know, yes, we could contend outside the window and you mentioned one way. I think there's a number of ways they could stay with that. But you know, if, if the team doesn't win it in two, three years, whatever that looks like, whether that's bringing in, you know, one of those, some of those younger guys, whether that's going with a more veteran laden lineup, I think, you know, Daryl can always come back. It's not like we've got him for those three years and we have to get rid of him because he's not our contract. I mean, they just re-signed him on a second contract. So I think, you know, we, you don't want to sign him for too long, especially a guy who's that age. Um, but we can always bring him back if, you know, we're contending, we're moving forward, but we're just not quite getting what we want. But yeah, I can't see them thinking, well, this is our year and oh, well, if we don't, we'll do it next year. I think you look at it as, you know, we got three years to do this with this core. Again, looking at where we're at with these guys. Um, and then, you know, hopefully we get it in one of those years. Yep. And you're right. I mean, there's a lot of young guys. They'll start cycling in and out and that's, 
that's, I mean, that's a kind of a completely different discussion, right? Is what is the Calgary Flames in four years? Yeah. Well, you can even go back four years ago and like literally like the only guys that are left are Shillington, Anderson, and uh, Backland. And exactly. Stone. Like, it, exactly. So it's like, yes, the Flames will exist. <laughs> that, yeah. That's about it. Yeah, and I mean, we've got some long-term contracts. We know some guys who will very likely be here because of their long-term contracts, but who knows what the rest of the team will look like. Mm -hmm. So thanks for sending that in, Al. Hopefully we answered your question. If not, let us know. Um, and again, feel free to get a hold of us. We'd love to hear your questions through social media, through our website, or you can even text us or call us. Our phone number is 403-768-2121. Again, 403-768-2121. I promise, Matter, I won't pick up. But you can leave us a voicemail. You can send us a text. We'd love to hear from you and answer your questions. Yeah, and uh, one thing that I've been noticing uh, some commentaries around the internet and such um, concerns over uh, Cadre's uh, random breakout year at the age of thirty-one last year, um, and like, why wasn't he that good in Toronto? And like, can you really realistically expect him to be? like a 90 point player and you know i i've just been hearing a lot of chatter and so i wanted to comment on that what's your thought uh it's the toronto maple leafs um <laughs> uh, they're not really usually very good at developing their own guys in a proper way that's part of the reason why they've been terrible for forever um and it's not really surprising that when he got traded to the avalanche he kind of found a different gear and like even the the first year he was with Colorado, he looked significantly better than he did with Toronto. And like last year, it's like all the pieces fell into place. And it might be just one of those situations where like the things that were holding him back aren't anymore. And you know. I'll be honest, I don't expect him to have a 90 or even an 87 point year again, but I think even if we can get him, you know, north of 55, we're doing well. Yeah, well, I could see him put up 70 plus and, you know, like his career has basically been like a 40, 50 ish point guy, which even if like that's not really bad or anything, like if that's like for $7 million at like now's production, like that's not bad. But it, it's just one of those where, um, like, when he was with Toronto, he didn't seem to have that uh, ability to create stuff out of nothing as much or as consistently as he seems to now. And, like, the last two games and, like, last year with Colorado, it seemed like pretty much every shift he was doing something to create time and space. And I, I think that is a difference in his game since leaving Toronto that uh, finding that in himself to be more like present offensively uh, that than what he has been before. And that'll depend who he's playing with as well. Yeah. And it, it's just one of those interesting things to keep an eye on as the season goes along. Cause you know, it, he doesn't seem like the same guy, because I, I, you know, I've watched enough Toronto games over the years that you you know their I guys. Apologize. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I feel sorry for myself, really. But um, you know, you get to know how players play, and it he doesn't seem like the same guy offensively than he as he was then. So it'll be interesting to see as you know, like we hit game twenty, game thirty, game forty, if like what we're seeing now continues or, you know, he reverts a bit back towards what he was. Before we get to game 20 and 30, we got to get through three, four and five. And I had to say to Matt before we started recording tonight, the universe is back the way it should be. I won the predictions game. I'm up one, nothing. Matt, yeah. back to the basement with well, you. You allowed me the, to win last year. And, you know, now it's like, okay, buddy. I figured you, it's you your 10th your season. I got to be nice to you for once. Yeah, exactly. You, you got your win. Bravo. Cl round of applause. I'm still and, waiting for the ring in the mail. Yeah. And now uh, that's enough of you, buddy. And we're back to business. One nothing. That's right. <laughs> I, I, if I if I got a ring for every win, I have nine wins. I'd look at one of those rapper guys who's got the big ring on every finger, and 
I'm going for the tenth one. Yeah. Um, so I won last week. I said that the Flames would beat Colorado Edmonton. You thought they'd lose Colorado, win Edmonton, which was a fair assumption. Um, this week we got three games to predict. We've got the Vegas Golden Knights coming to Calgary on the 18th, a 7 p.m. start. Then Thursday night, the 20th, the Flames are in the Dome against the Buffalo Sabres for a 7.30 start. And the 22nd, the Calgary Flames are here uh, again at the Dome against Carolina, an 8 p.m. start. So, Matt, let's do two things. Since Sutter says Vladar is going to play once a week, what do you think the score is going to be, and when do you think Vladar plays? Uh, well, I think the Flames will uh, be 2-1 and one this week. Um, what are the wins? The first two, and then losing to Carolina, because Carolina is really good. Um, I, I think Vegas is significantly worse this year than they were last year um not having a regular goaltender uh with leonard being out all year yeah who is their starter uh, right now? logan something uh, logan thompson i think it, who? It, yeah it, it's he, exactly uh <laughs> yeah uh their, their goalie system's kind of non-existent so it's like Sure, you're an NHL player. Cool. Uh, well, Leonard's out, Brassois out. Yeah. So, yeah, that gives him Logan Thompson, and I don't know who his backup would be. Yeah. I shall go find out. Insert AHL somebody there. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, and I think that's going to be a big problem for the Golden Knights this year is not having really good goaltending. Yeah, and, like, the rest of their team, like, because they're very veteran. Aiden Hill. Yeah. He's not bad, but he, he, not great either. Um, it, it, because Vegas is a very veteran-laden team and has been since their inception, those guys are starting to get run a little long in the tooth. And like while they're still good, I, I don't see them being as... It's sort of like San Jose a few years ago where like it's like, yeah, but not really. You know, like dangerous think- but not that dangerous i think the flames have to get the win against vegas vegas has been a team that's really stymied the flames since they came into the league yeah and it's sort of getting like anaheim where you know it's a little ridiculous let's actually beat them now (laughs) yeah and if and you know if we're trying to sort of turn over these new leaves and say okay we beat the champs we beat edmonton i think when i think about teams the flames need to get success against this year vegas is on that list yeah Exactly. It, basically, every team in our own division we have to have supremacy against. And then, you know, the good teams like Minnesota, St. Louis, and Colorado in the, the Central. Um, and then we play the vaunted Buffalo Sabres. <laughs> you know, and, and again, the Sabres game, as much as we can make fun of the Sabres, might give us a chance to try things like putting Rajishka in the lineup. Yeah, I agree. And that might be one of those where you give opportunities more and see. And like this is another uh Vladar start I'm expecting. You're going you're going Buffalo for Vladar? Yeah. It just makes the most logical sense cuz the other two teams are more dangerous, so Markstrom fits better. Um, you know, speaking of Vladar starts, I'm flipping ahead in the schedule here. If Daryl's going to play Vladar once a week, there's really very few weeks when we don't have at least one home game. Like, I think we saw him once in the Dome last year. Um, and the weeks that we're not in the Dome, I mean, we're away all year. Like, you know, you're you're probably going to get quite a bit of Dan Vladar in the Saddle Dome this year. Yep, and that's perfectly fine. And, you know, if he continues to play like he did, I, I don't think too many people are going to be complaining too much. I'm going to go, I'm going to keep, uh, go with my gut, which I did last week. I'm going to say the Flames win all three of these. Um, I don't think they're going to win them, you know, by a high margin. I think it'll be, you know, five, three, four, three, that kind of thing. But I think the flames can win all three. If they're going to stumble, it'll be Carolina, but I'm going to be brave and say all three. And I agree with you. I think the one that makes the most sense for Dan Vladar is Buffalo. Yeah. It, it, you got him going in Edmonton. You can put him in against Buffalo. Yeah. And it, it, it'll be interesting to see. Like, I'm very interested in that Carolina game. Uh, Carolina and basically Tampa Bay are the two teams that I view as being like the likeliest Eastern Conference teams to make it to the Stanley Cup Finals just because of their level of defense and goaltending. 
Um, so, you know, it is same with like the New York Rangers and uh, like, that's another like big test for this team is can they go up against another of the juggernauts in the NHL and how do they fare against them? Well, and I mean, strategically too, if we want to get that far down the road, you don't want to drop points to the West. So you've got to beat Vegas. You could drop the points to Carolina. It doesn't hurt as much. Exactly. So three games this week, more more of, I guess, a full week. I'd say three games is your average per week generally in the NHL. So, yeah. And, um, and it, it'll be interesting to see how the Flames do just over the next couple months. Because if you look at the schedule, basically from now till Christmas, it's mostly very good teams on a very regular basis coming to, to play the Flames. And uh, then after that, like March and April, it's ba- basically all the rebuilding-ish teams that we cycle through then. So it'll be interesting to see, like, with the schedule being so tough off the start, if the Flames can continue to be good off the hop. Well, it's sort of interesting, too, that we are at home until November 5th, and then we're really on the road for the whole month. So you really get that time at home to build your chemistry, and then we'll get to see the Flames start their road game. Mm -hmm. And that certainly helps, especially with practices, because you don't need to worry about travel at all. And you can iron out all those kinks, like the Huberdeau and Toffoli timing issue. You know, like that can be worked on significantly with daily practices um whereas if they're on the road you your you know hotels airports and all that kind of stuff and there's just not enough time you're just basically showing up for the games and then on to the next jaunt Matt, i think that about wraps us up for this week let's enjoy these three games this week the next three at the cell dome and i will talk to you after game five And as always, Oilers suck. Oh, wait, I mean, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.